good morning, everyone. As Oscar continues to play Showers of Blessing, I just wanted to point out something to you today. On the, the screen, you see this idyllic painting of a landscape with a rainbow. It's also on our bulletin cover in print here today. This is a painting by Robert S. Duncanson. It's a, he's a black landscape artist, pre-Civil War era in Ohio. Landscape artists and artistry is something that was very common as we expanded west. And Mr. Duncanson, this piece of art is in the Smithsonian Art Museum. And it was there at the inauguration of Joe Biden. Jill Biden said that the rainbow in the painting encouraged her to think about better times. So this Black History Month, I wanted to share with you as we're talking about Jesus on the plains in our gospel, about how the dream of what the plains may have looked like for our ancestors this Black History Month with this painting by Robert S. Duncanson. Thanks be to God. Welcome everyone to St. James Presbyterian Church, where we are here on the corner of 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. And it is idyllic when you look over in the park. The snow that was falling this morning was so light. It's almost like God was taking the clouds and using them as powdered sugar to put on the park over across the street. But the streets are clear. <laughs> so we are grateful for that and grateful to God for clear streets. Let me just pin my... Uh, let me see. I need to focus. While we're doing that, I'm going to, do, there we are. It finally worked. And then I am going to do this other thing that I forgot to do, which is, where is it? If you'll be with me, if you'll bear with me just a moment, it's really important that we take care of our guests who are online as well. And I want to take off this pen and see why I cannot find the button to go to Facebook Live to share. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, wow, what a, what a bummer. Thank you, Oscar. <laughs> As we do our technology, we do our best to try and be on Facebook Live and on YouTube and on, on Zoom. There's a little button that says more and you open it up and click a button. That more is no longer on this page today. <laughs> so we will put it on our YouTube page and I will, from the Zoom recording, and I will also put it on my Facebook page and the church's Facebook page. With that said, welcome again to St. James Presbyterian Church here in the corner of 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue in this wonderful village of Harlem in the city of New York. Here at St. James Presbyterian Church, we have been in ministry in New York City for over 127 years, and we are grateful to continue on in the four steps of our forebearers who came before us. So now let us prepare ourselves for worship. Let us prepare ourselves for worship by hearing the first psalm in the book of Psalms, the first psalm in the Psalter. And it is an instructive psalm so that we know that if we stay within the word of God, that we will be blessed. So hear Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of the scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law they meditate both day and night. They are like 
trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and their leaves they do not wither and all that they do they prosper the wicked are not so but are like chaff that the wind drives away Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked, it will perish. That is our psalm of the day, psalm number one. And now I invite you to hear the wonderful voice of our liturgist today, ruling elder Andrea Bradford who will be joining us and she will unmute herself and share with us the liturgy that you will find in the bulletin and that I will share on screen as well. Ruling Elder Andrea Bradford. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so great to hear that beautiful psalm. It's my mother's favorite psalm. As some of you know, my mother's going to be 100 in May. And she uses this psalm all the time and says that when she reads from the Bible, she starts with Psalm 1. So uh, it's so nice to hear this, this psalm. I bring you if you give me just a moment so I can bring up our participants. I think I understand what the problem is. Okay. I made Chris the host instead of the co-host. All right. Chris, can you make me the co-host <laughs> or the host? Yeah. I'll oh, re no, I'll do it. Do I'm reclaiming my host. And then I'm <laughs> making you co-host. And then uh, I can start recording on Facebook. <laughs> Got it. The things we learn, the things we learn. Okay. We have some people in here in the congregation today and it feels like old home church. They're passing out candy to one another. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ruling elder Andrea Bradford, we're ready to go. Thank you so much everyone for your patience again. Oh, no problem, no problem. I was about to say that it's chilly down here in Huntsville, Alabama too. So I, um, I bring the warmth that I can share with you, but, but being in community with you brings warmth for us all. So it's so nice to hear your description of the snow on the trees in the park uh, as sort of powdered sugar. That's a beautiful image. And the image of the rainbow, which is always a great image. So I now take us to our worship, our, our prayer time, our time together. Let us continue the worship after the beautiful psalm with our call to worship. Our God calls us to speak truth to the rivers hmm. as they carry the woes of the world to the sea. Who are we to name the woes as they swim by, hoping to cling to the water's edge? Everyone's welcome to come in. You, me, we are all the ones named by God to celebrate the washing of woes hmm. from the land. We can open our hearts to the blessings of the land and new clean waters, a gift of life. Will you give thanks for the promise of the blessings as we celebrate God's glory to us? We will come to this moment in the time of cleansing and we will dance on the shores of the music of the lapping waves. We will gather the bounty of the trees harvest in grateful praise of God, our provider, and we will pray prayers that one day all will recognize that God's plan for us is better than our wildest dream. Amen. Amen. Our opening song, our opening hymn is To God Be the Glory, number 285 in your Blue Presbyterian hymnals. It's one of the most glorious morning hymns. God be the 
the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done, great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great the rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But higher and greater will be our under our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Who oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Yes, to God be the glory, to God be the glory. We adore God, and we enter into this time of prayer with our opening prayer of adoration that allows us to continue that adoration and expression of adoration of God. Our prayer of adoration says, present with us. You consecrate the very air we breathe. Adonai, your same breath is the holy essence by which you enable our bodies to claim life itself. It is your breath that flows in our lungs, that cleanses our blood. We bless you for the antidote we access. When anxiety and fear turn us away from you, you tell us to breathe. Breathe in and breathe out. Deep breath is the medicine that calms our bodies, helps our minds rest, slows our racing hearts and brings us closer to you. What a miracle worker you are. Even before we open our eyes, you remind us we are alive as we breathe ourselves into waking. And that is just the beginning of a day and a night's blessing. Amen. Amen, amen. So let us sing our song. The Lord is blessing me right now. This old gospel tune arranged by Nolan Williams in our African American Heritage Hymnal. The Lord is blessing me right now. Sing that again. We say, The Lord is blessing me right now, right now. Oh, the Lord is blessing me right now, oh, right now. You see, He woke me up. Blessing me right now, right now, right now. 
God woke me. He woke me this morning. I was clothed and in my right mind. No, he didn't let me sleep too late. But God woke me right on time. Oh, he woke me up this morning. It started me on my way. Lord, his blessing. Right now, right now, you see God woke you, he woke you this morning, look at you, you all are clothed, and in your right mind, no, he didn't let you sleep too late, he woke you, woke you, woke you, right on time, oh, he woke you up this morning. minute and the next minute as long as we are breathing as long as we woke up we are blessed yes. amen. amen we continue with our prayers remembering that it is a blessing to pray yes, there's so many people as i say all the time there's so many people in this world who do not have the privilege of praying not only can we pray but we can come to community with each other and pray prayer is so powerful yes. we have expressed our adoration for god yes. and god's blessing for us with us we know that we are fallible yes. and god has given us an opportunity to to say that we are fallible but we keep trying sometimes we don't get it right but we keep trying and so we come now together in confession with this call mm. as we share our blessings with one another. Right. We must also be mindful that we often sin despite your compassion yeah. and grace. Yeah. Oh, Lord, please hear our prayer as we confess now together to you. If we are honest, honest, we know that our gratitude is short-lived in the breath of blessing. Instead, the woes of our lives become the dictator of our actions and even our thoughts. Maybe something as simple as stubbing our toe on the nightstand starts to ruin our day. Perhaps we remember the load of work before us for the day that frustrates us and starts to sour our mood. Could it be that the late bus or subway distracts us from your blessing? Or perhaps the fast approaching zero in our bank account leaves us feeling helpless. We realize that with each moment of the day, there is an opportunity for us to claim Woe is me. And all the while, 
you are with us, healing the pain of our toe, <laughs> helping us to get the right amount of work done that needs to be done. Even when late at our destination, we arrive safely. And with that approaching zero in the bank account, you still provide what we need. <laughs> Please have mercy on us when our woes turn us from you. May your blessings be our God and bring us your peace. Let us now have a moment of silent confession where we bring to God our own opportunities to recognize that we focus on the woes rather than the blessings that God prepares for us every day. We are reminded in the music of our traditions, our traditional music, that sometimes the most effective songs are the ones that have the simplest words. Oh Lord, have mercy. Jesus, I love you. When I'm in trouble. Sometimes when we have no words, a simple hum has to do.
Yes, yes, yes. Just the simple. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Mercy and grace on us as we continue in this life. God says, yes, I know you are trying. I know you love me. I love you. And I forgive you when you step off the path. Well, <laughs> we have an assurance of that forgiveness of God's pardon. How can we be sure that God hears our prayer, that God knows in our hearts our call for mercy is real? With God's grace, the blessings, the blessings keep coming. <laughs> that is our assurance. That is, hallelujah, our joy. Amen. Amen and amen. And as Charles Albert Tinley wrote in the 1800s, the storm is passing over, y'all. The storm is passing over. He didn't write those songs that were about woe. He wrote these songs about God's blessed assurance. He said, courage my soul and let us journey on. Though the night has come, it won't be very long. God, the morning light appears. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Take courage, my soul, and let us journey on though the night has come it won't be very long and thanks be to god the morning light appears the storm is passing over the storm is passing over the storm is passing over, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The storm is passing over, the storm is passing over, the storm is passing over, Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The storm is passing over. God says the storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Amen and amen and amen. Sometimes when I sing these songs, I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> so good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. James Presbyterian Church again. It is a blessing to be here with you today. I'm glad to see that a friend of ours came from checking us out on Facebook, just sort of showed up and said, yeah, that's how I heard about this. <laughs> I'm also glad that another friend is like dragging his friends over and saying, you got to come on and get this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad that our other people have been able to come out and really be able to sort of feel um, through the midst and through the rain that, and through the snow that we are here and that we are here to worship. So here at St. James, as we mentioned, we are here every Sunday. We are now opening up as, as the pandemic becomes an endemic and we learn how to live with it as it's finally being declared an endemic, just like the flu. And we'll figure out what it is that we need to do. Mm -hmm. So that means for us here in St. James that we will be open. We are still encouraging you to wear your masks in worship service, especially when we have little ones running around because we have little ones running around very often, like literally 
running around. <laughs> and so we want to avail them to their best health opportunity since they are not able to get the vaccine. Um, I'm looking for one of these bulletins. One moment. I gave them all out. Because I want to get to our announcements for the day. Um, we have welcomed you. And we want to share the screen that will share some of our announcements with us as well. And I will do this. Very good, very good. Here at St. James, I wanted to remind you that what we do in terms of our stewardship and what it is that we believe that God is calling us to do, we have in our bulletin a ministry impact statement. What is a ministry impact statement? A ministry impact statement is what it means for St. James to be open on this corner all year long. What it means to be a presence of ministry in the community, and that speaks volumes. Helping families deal with the addiction and recovery with the 12-step program that we allow to be, that is hosted here every, every Monday evening. We also create a community Bible study and have, even before this whole thing with Zoom, we were doing Zoom Bible study so that people could join us from, from Florida and from Massachusetts. We were doing that. We open our doors to international visitors who get an opportunity to get a feel of what it's like to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, even though sometimes they only come in for gospel music. It's still the same good news that we share. So I just wanted to share that with you and that that is what, if you can't grab your mind around sort of what it means to sort of say, well, you know, I want to pledge or I want to tithe, but sometimes in our younger generations, they want to figure out, well, what is the impact I'm making? That's the impact that you're making. So thanks be to God. I also wanted to um, ask if you would please visit and subscribe our social media so that we will be able to make more use of that social media. The more followers that you have on YouTube and Facebook, the more you're able to sort of work some of the nuances and boost some of your posts so that more people can see them. So we want to avail ourselves to that as well. I also wanted to uh, put this in here. What did I say? That we will be having um, our web address and our phone number as on our bulletins and on our screen. So you see that our phone number is 212-283-4541. If you would like to leave a message for us, and we'll promise to do our best to get to it. You can also email us again at www.stjamesharlemnyc.org. You'll see all the information um, regarding our Zoom, regarding our pandemic policy. You'll also see the calendar feature where you can go there and click on that and find out what our Bible study is and also how to access that Bible study. Um, and that website has lots of beautiful pictures, has the history of St. James as well. And just coincidentally, at the very bottom of our first page on the web page <laughs> is a little yellow button that says donate. And you can click on that and a page from PayPal will open up and you're able to give to St. James and you're able to leave a note to let us know how God is blessing you. So also, before we move on to what you see on the screen, and I move on to the next saying from my mom to you and our Bible study information, I want you to know that, oh my God, that just went out of my thought. It just went out of my brain. Well, I'll go back to it then. From my mom to you, I wanted to focus on this idea of Frederick Douglass. This is why what I was thinking about went out of my head. This is a very long quote but it's something that's very important for us to understand. This comes from Frederick Douglass's autobiography of a slave. And it's a matter of how many people ask, how did slaves and why did slaves follow the, the teachings of Jesus Christ and Paul when it weighed down so heavily on us? How did we learn to become Christians? And I like Frederick Douglass's version of this and what he talks about from his own experience of being a slave. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt slaveholding, women whipping, cradle plundering, 
partial and hypocritical Christianity of the land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the boldest of all frauds, and the grossest of all libels. He knew a distinction between the good news of Jesus Christ and how it was being used to oppress other people. So I say that from this saying today, let us learn from Frederick Douglass and work our best to love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I think that was important enough for me to lose my train of thought. <laughs> Here are our Bible study verses for tomorrow evening. Um, on Valentine's Day, we will be having Bible study. Um, a reading from Genesis. Um, it's a reading when Joseph comes, when his brothers come back to Egypt and say to him, he says, well, now I am your brother. And they're like, oh my goodness, what did we do? We're so afraid. And he's like, I love you. Just go get dad and come on back. I got a place for you to stay during the job. So that's a wonderful <laughs> scripture. Psalm 37. We'll continue a little bit in 1 Corinthians 15. And we'll continue on again in the Gospel of Luke. So that's where we're at um, in terms of our announcements and our Bible study. I also want to thank our liturgist, ruling elder Andrea Bradford, musician Oscar Maxwell, and Zoom technician Elder Chris Bozel for sharing your gifts with love, dedication, spirit, and enthusiasm every single Sunday. I believe that is all of the good, all for the good of the church, and if not, we will continue um, to bring the good news to you from our community and our church. And now I remembered <laughs> what it is I wanted to say, and I knew I would. There's a chat feature here in the, on the actual um, Zoom, and there is a way for you to leave comments on Facebook. We encourage you to do that. We encourage you to say amen. We encourage you to list your prayer requests. We encourage you to, if something strikes you that you have a question about or something that you want to know more about, we encourage you to write that and let us know. And if you're on the phone, we've given you the phone number, 212-283-4541. You can just say, Pastor, I got a question. And we'll get back to you with that. But we want to be more engaged with one another. Just because we're online doesn't mean we're not a community. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Ruling Elder Andrea Bradford. Yes. Thank you so much for saying that. It's so great to just expand our community, to expand the, the comments and the reactions of the people who are in community with us all the time, um, not just on Sunday. So now we get a chance to share a little love with each other. We have a peace yeah. of Christ. It says, speaking to the crowd on the plains, Jesus shares the joy of God's way of the world. This sharing of the good news is the peace of Christ. May this peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We will now mm. open up the gallery so that you are able to sort of speak with one also. another and say peace of Christ to you all. Peace, peace, peace. Peace of Christ. Christ peace everyone. of Christ. Peace 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 of Christ. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Oscar. Hi, Chris. 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 Hi, Hi, Karen. I've gotten Hi, some good Karen. recommendations for you to from me from you to watch. Okay. Hey, DT. Okay. You've been good. Hi, everything. <laughs>
Thelma. Hey, Chris. Hey, Thelma. Who do I have here? Let me get this gallery. Thelma. Hi, Thelma. Thelma. Hi, Frank. Hi, Thelma. Hi, Frank. 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 Hi,
of their doings. And from 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 12 through 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, <laughs> whom, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. Well. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. Mm -hmm. And our gospel reading. From Luke, the sixth chapter, verses 17 through 26. Luke 6, 17 through 26. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Mm -hmm. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I preached a sermon on this for video last week, did Bible study on Monday, prepared for today, and I'm still taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> These scriptures are very, very, very powerful, and we will come and speak and meditate on those. But if you hear Christ talking about woes and blessings, he's talking to a crowd of people who feel lost, and he's assuring them that they are not not alone. But my sermon, thought that I want us to think about today is, are you facing the woe direction? Are you facing the woe direction? But we'll talk about that in just a moment, because right now I want to speak to you, to the, our younger people, to let the children come about this troublesome line for me 
in the book of Jeremiah. We spoke about this in Bible study. When God says, the heart is devious above all else. What in the world does that mean? We talk about wanting God to enter into our hearts. We talk about coming up with Valentine's Day. We talk about love. Oh, the great thing about love and how our hearts are so true. But what does it mean when it says the heart is devious above all else? Hmm. The heart. The heart is a trickster in many different ways because it clouds things up. So I want to talk to you about this. When the heart sees trees, the mind hopes for roots. When the mind sees trees, when the heart sees trees, the mind hopes for roots. And I have the image of one of my favorite trees in the world. It's a, an image on the slide of the baobab tree, which is actually the tree of life in Africa. And it looks like it's upside down because there's this huge trunk and then it has these branches that when the leaves fall off, it looks like these roots are headed towards the sky. Sometimes in mythology, they said that God was angry with the tree and planted it upside down. <laughs> but this tree that you see on this slide they can last for as long as 3,000 to 6,000 years. The fruit of the baobab tree has so many nutrients and so many uses to be helpful for life. But it is the root system. I paired an image of a root system of this tree planted by water so that you can see how far it extends. But let me go back to when the heart sees trees, the mind hopes for roots. I don't know how many times if you think that you're going to walk through a forest and you're going to look up at the canopy of the trees and say how incredible and how incredibly beautiful it is, I can guarantee you one thing. You're going to fall on your face. Because when you walk and you look up at the trees, you trip over the roots. Because the roots are protruding and they're there, they're underneath the surface of the entire forest. And you have to take into account that the roots are holding that beauty all together. So you may think that it's so beautiful to see the beautiful trees out in front of me. So the heart gets all happy. The heart feels good because it sees the trees. And then you have to remember that the mind wants you to know that there are roots underneath that it's not just about the beauty in front of you, but it's about the foundation of that. And if the foundation of that is solid and good, then its beauty is solid and good. Why am I talking about that now? Hmm. Because you're gonna go through life and there'll be many things that you'll look at and your heart will tell you, ooh, I like that. <laughs> And you'll engage in that and with that. And then down the line, you realize that your mind was clouded because you were looking and seeing and feeling with your heart. So when God is saying that the heart is devious above all else, God knows that the heart has something to do with our feelings. And our feelings can often disguise what's good for us. And I could talk about love because everybody's gone through a bad love experience, maybe, in their life once or twice. There may be one or two people who are lucky who have never had that happen in their life. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about grapes. In Marstown, New Jersey, there's this store. There was this store on, in, in the hollow on the main street that was evergreen, then became Martin Luther King Avenue. And it had like this fresh fruit. And you would go in there, and you'd go in the back, and you'd pull it out the refrigerator. And it was like, they had these grapes one day. And I love grapes. And my dad said, you want to get some grapes down? I said, yeah, can I get some grapes? I said, he said, how much you want? I'm like, I want a whole pound. He said, huh? I don't think you want a pound. Why don't we just get, I said, I want a whole pound. And this is the kind of man that Dorsey McQueen was. 
<laughs> Dorsey McQueen would say, you want a whole pound? I'm going to give you a whole pound. I'm going to buy you two. And you can eat those the rest of the day. And I was in heaven. I looked at those purple grapes bursting at the seams, and I just started eating them and eating them and eating them. Oh, and it was dripping down my face. And Dad said, clean up your mouth, boy. Or I clean up my mouth, and I eat more, and I eat more. And I got them home, and there were like very few left because I didn't want to share them with anybody. I didn't want to share them with Dad, but he wasn't reaching for any. I just ate and ate and ate and ate and ate. And I was so happy. I got home, there were a couple left. I'm like, I'm full. I had all those grapes. Mom said, how many grapes, how much grapes did you give him, Dorsey? He said, I gave him two pounds because he said he wanted it. She said, Dorsey. I'm like, what? And the next thing I know, rumble, rumble, tumble, tumble in the stomach. I ran in that bathroom. I was in that bathroom for the next three hours. My mind didn't tell me that you can't eat two pounds of grapes in one setting, but my heart told me that I could. The heart is deceived, devious above all else. <laughs> so I'm just asking and sharing that story with you to say that whenever your heart speaks to you about something and you're so attracted to that, stop for a moment and just ask God to clear your mind so that you can see the benefits and the things that may need to be changed in that situation. So don't let your heart rule you, but don't shy away from the beauty that your heart can show you either. Use common sense, because common sense comes with discernment with God. Thanks be to God. Gracious God, we know that there will be times, even some of us who have ordered these Girl Scout cookies, oh God, we know some of us are going to be tempted to sit at that table and keep eating and keep eating and keep eating. We know, oh God, that tomorrow on Valentine's Day, that there will be people who are desperately searching to not be alone on Valentine's Day because they, their heart is calling them to and that they'll go out with someone who will, who will not be the right person for them at all. We also know, God, that you want us to consider that you have a will for us and that what is in your mind for us will help cloud the judgment of our heart so that our pure heart and a clear mind will be able to give true love to this world and appreciation for everything you bring to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I, I forgot about that story of the grapes. <laughs> Woo. Amen. But here now, this simple song. It won't be too long. Take a sip of tea from my covered cup. <laughs>
your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark at the end of that storm is a gold Rogers and Hammerstein. Thank you, Oscar. <laughs> ah. When reading these scriptures about woes and curses, even our Corinthians text, Paul is hinting at these blessings and these woes and these curses. And I'll just get it out of the way. In the Corinthians text, it's very subconscious, but he's talking about the fact that if Christ has come and we claim Christ's resurrection, and that's why we are a church of Corinth, and you're worried about whether or not people are going to be resurrected who have already passed away, and you're saying it's not going to happen, then you are calling God a liar. You are saying that all the things that you've come to believe have been in vain. All the suffering that we've, we've gone through and, and all the joy that we've found in coming together and knowing that Jesus has come to relieve that suffering and that God's grace and mercy is real. All of that, you'd rather choose the misery you had before by not believing that Jesus was raised. Because if you don't believe in resurrection, then you are cursed and woe is you. Hmm. But if you believe in Jesus, you believe that he got up on that third day and you are blessed. So that helps put that in context. Hmm. Jeremiah, very simple with his blessings and his woes. The psalm, very clear with his blessings and its woes. And Jesus now, let's get to Jesus. This is in the book of Matthew what they call the Sermon on the Mount. Part of the Sermon on the Mount, that beautiful sermon in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, that goes on where Jesus is talking about the blessings of, these, of your entire way of being and your spiritual way of being. Jesus is very clear, and Luke is very clear about what Jesus is talking about here. So much so that when you hear in this particular text that Jesus was healing the sick, and taking care of unclean spirits, the first thing we think about are those demons, right? Those demons that Jesus like says, go out. I know it's Satan in you. That's not what Jesus is doing in the Lucan text. These unclean spirits are a spiritual 
a spiritual darkness. Just like John the Baptist was talking to people about repenting from the ways that you've gone away from God. Just as all the prophets are talking about repent from the ways that you have gone away from God. Jesus is saying this is an unclean thing that is making your spirit unclean. So come forward and, and let me release this from you with teaching. Let me release this from you with healing. Let me release this from you with the love of God so that you can get back to God and on the track back to holiness. On the track back to sanctity so that you will be ready to receive the rewards when God's kingdom and God's kingdom comes. That's what Jesus is talking about in that first section of our pericope, that first section before he starts talking about the blessings and the woes. Another thing that I love about this particular text is that Jesus has just been in the mountains. He's been up there. He's called all 12 disciples. And when it says that he looks up at the disciples, it's only because Jesus is enmeshed. I like to think of him being enmeshed, feeling this power go out of him, people touching him, all grabbing on him to be healed, all, all calling on them to say, hey, make me holy, make me sanctified. And then he, he lifts up his head, as a teacher often does, to teach the class of disciples, his followers, but here, and this is what I love about Jesus, he doesn't just walk away and look up at his disciples and teach them. He lifts his head up so that all that who are around them will be privy to this good news. That lets me know that the good news of Jesus Christ and these blessings that he's talking about are for us. They're not just for the people that are there on the plane that day. They're not just for the disciples that are there that day. They're not just for the sick people that are there that day. They're for all of us to hear clearly and wonderfully what these blessings are for us that are within the good news of the kingdom of God. So, Jesus, wanting these people to turn around and to be clean and to be sanctified, that is what led me to think about this topic for this sermon. Are you facing in the woe direction? It's a pun, a silent pun on, are you facing in the wrong direction? Because I often think that very often we are so busy focusing and turning on the woes that we are not looking at the blessings. We are so busy looking at all of the horror, all of the pain, all of the trauma, that we are not looking at the blessing, at the hope, at the holding of God that God has for us, the holding of us that God has. Are you looking in the woe direction or are you looking in the blessing direction? And why am I talking about that in this particular Sunday on Black History Month? Well, because I think, my friends, when we think about black history and how it's taught in this country, when we think about black history and how it's not being taught in this country, all that we focus on in, the, in my curriculum when I grew up was there was slavery. <laughs> I didn't read Frederick Douglass until I picked up the book in the library because I was a geek and I hung around the library in eighth grade and found books and stayed after school and read. That's where I found the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, the autobiography of a slave. That's where I found out about Phyllis Wheatley, the first African-American poet to be published. That's how I found out about it. I didn't find out about it in my classroom. What I found out about was chattel slavery. What I found out about was these, these savages that were brought over from this country, from this continent, so that people could steal the riches there and then come here and make more riches off of the, the backs of people who were savages, people who were animals, the people that you treated so badly that even when you took their personhood and children became from that even if they look like you, you said 1% makes you one of them. Mm. No owning property, no testifying at trial. All of this being sold from your mother, being sold from your father. I knew I was very well versed in that. Black history and the way that it's dealt with in the United States of America is very much a looking in the woe direction. Why? 
Because when you keep people in the woe direction, they get stuck in their trauma and stuck in a place that you say, that is your place. But when you turn someone to see the blessings that is before them, when you read the book, Roots, <laughs> And you see how Alex Haley winds the story and sees how these blessings touch one another generation to generation to generation until he's finally saying, these are my people. And because they held on and looked for the blessings and the opportunities, I am here. We were talking in Bible study about what happened in Birmingham? What happened in Birmingham with the dogs? Mm -hmm. You know, people were meeting at the Sistine Street Baptist Church, coming together when King came to say, we want to protest this. We want to have protests about what is going on downtown. So we need you to protest. We need you to come out. And the parents and the adults said, no, we work for the white people. And I see that I will be hungry, I will be beat, I can be lynched, I can't do that. But there were kids <laughs> from elementary school all the way up to the high school who signed a pledge and said, then we will go. Hmm. That's why you see the dogs biting. That's why you see the hoses. Bull Connor couldn't stop them from coming. A thousand kids in one day were arrested and thrown in jail. A thousand kids. And King and the civil rights people recognize that if we overcrowd the jails, they'll go broke trying to feed us. <laughs> they'll go broke trying to hold us. They don't have enough room. So over and over till thousands of children were arrested. And we look at that as the travesty of what Bull Connor did, but if you think about the stroke of genius of keeping children safe, because the media came in for, for, for this travesty, and that's what kept them safe. But they were behind bars, and they had to be fed, even though it wasn't good food. They were still there, and their parents were still working, and it changed. These children changed the civil rights movement from being in jail and saying, yes, we are going to count our blessing as our youth because we are beholden to these employers. We are beholden to, these, to pay rent to these folk. And they don't know whose child is whose. This powerful moment in history, I talk about this because when I want to look back on black history, I don't want to think back about the, the, the photograph that was captured of the horror of the child being hit with the hose. I want to think about them tumbling around, getting up and saying, okay, I'm ready to go to jail now for a point, for a purpose. That is looking at the blessing of where God is calling for you rather than looking at the woe. Our history, all of oppressed people's history, is littered with these blessings. And as long as we are holding on to looking at our woes, to define and identify who we are as people, and who we are as, I don't care if it's, if it's because you're a woman, I don't care if it's because you're LGBTQIA, I don't care if it's because you're African American, I don't care if it's because you're Asian and what's going on in our country now, I don't care what it's about. As long as you start to define yourself by that woe, you will always be able to be stepped upon and be belittled. But when you claim your blessings, when you claim your blessings, you become not a child of the world, but you become a child of God's in the eyes of all. This is what Jesus is actually saying in this text. He's saying to you, if you are poor and you are hungry, you will be fed. What you're going through now, 
The prophets have gone through, we've all gone through. And if you look at our history and look at our text, God has always brought us out and made the other people end up suffering. When he says in that particular text, well, your reward will be in heaven. That has been an excuse historically for us to hold on to our woes and live in our woes and say, well, in the great by and by when I die, it's all going to be better. But put two and two together. What did Jesus say? Thy will be done where? <laughs> on earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus came as a Messiah, it wasn't about the great by and by. He was saying, I am here to bring the reality of God's justice now. And you have to understand that and you have to live in that and you have to hope in that in order for us to move forward in it. One of the things that I wanted to really get across to you about this not, not being in the woe, the woe direction, I want you to know this. When the heart privileges trauma, we see woe everywhere. Everywhere. But when the heart privileges God's blessings, the mind starts to see an opportunity for blessings everywhere. Ooh. When the heart privileges trauma, the mind sees woes everywhere. When the heart privileges God's blessings, we see an opportunity for blessing everywhere that's what happens when you have discernment and you allow God to enter into your mind because the heart will deceive you when I talk about being identified by your trauma think about who you are think about what has happened in your life and think about every time you hit a brick wall the perception that you have of yourself and all of those things from your past that start to explain it. And start, you start reveling back into that, well, that's who I am. I've always had this issue. I've always had this problem. I can't move forward. But when you start to see God's blessings, and I know that there are some people in this room right here now that know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when you start to privilege God's blessings, one day at a time, mm -hmm. your life is new. Don't look in the woe direction. <laughs> look in the blessing direction. Mm -hmm. Because God is constantly, constantly giving us blessings to hold on to, to pull us through. The woes. That's why that, that prayer that I wrote today talked about the very breath. The very breath that God has given us. When we breathe in and breathe out, physiologically our bodies can calm down. Our anxiety can shift. Our hearts can slow. Our blood pressure can go down just by breath. If that's not a blessing that we can hold on to in the midst of our trials, I don't know what is. God woke us up this morning and started us on our way. So we may not know the larger picture of why the world is such a mess. But stop looking at the trees with your heart and look at the roots of blessing that God is guiding us by. I am not going to worry about what I can't handle. I'm going to worry about the blessings that I can't. Because the blessings that I do have, that God lays in my hands, that is what guides me around the mess of the world. This is a sermon that is meant for us to let go of finally, finally let go of having our oppression define us. People will feel sorry for you when you're oppressed. Yeah, 
and they'll try and do what's good for you, but from their own perspective. But when you recognize your blessing, you start to tell your own story. And telling your own story through the blessings is more powerful than most people can, can fathom. Telling the story of Shiloh Presbyterian Church to the Presbyterian Historical Society. I said, thank you for your information, but let me clear up these few facts. I want you to hear from the voices of our people in this church what actually happened. The Presbytery of New York City didn't just let this church happen. Samuel Cornish, an abolitionist and a writer and someone who caused a lot of trouble, fought for it and said, in order for you to profess the Christianity that you believe in, you need to understand that we are blessed enough to have our own church. We are blessed enough to call our own people up from the South and to give them what it takes to move further North and to be with them here in New York City so that we can be their God people because our blessings, we want to tell our own story to our own people. And yet hundreds of years later, 200 years later, they are a footnote in the history of the Presbyterian Church USA by saying, well, we let them have a colored church. It's time to change the narrative, not from the woe of saying, oh, we let them have a church because they were slaves and we wanted to do what was right, but to say, no, we demanded a church because God showed us our blessing and we knew what we had to do. And you had to acquiesce to what God wanted, <laughs> not what you wanted. Not even what we wanted, but what God showed you was right. That's what happens when you stop looking in the woe direction and start looking in the right direction of blessings. I am so grateful to have those examples because they matter to us today. They matter. They matter. They matter. Everybody thinks that foundations like the Miz Foundation were all just so that people could talk about, well, that we need equality. We need, it's not need equality. We are equal, that's what women said. Mm -hmm. Not that we demand because it's, it, you, we need you to give it to us. We need you to recognize it because we are. It's difference. There's a difference between understanding your blessing. And I'll say this to close. If you want to start a revolution of good things, then see the blessings that God is laying out in front of us. Jesus did not come for us to go backwards and let the empire tell us what to do. Jesus came to lay out a plan that says, if you just follow me and believe, we will make it through and be blessed along the way. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Have you ever heard a woe when someone has said that? <laughs> all you hear are the blessings. Most gracious and loving God, we say thank you for the blessings. And even though we know that we have a tough road to hoe sometimes, God, we know that if we just keep our eyes on the prize and know that we are rooted in you, that we are like trees planted by water and that our fruit will yield, we know that you are blessing us right now, that you are blessing us by letting the water from the trees, from the rivers, come up through our roots and make us reach towards you, just like the Baobab does on the savannah of Africa. Oh God, we ask that you would not let our hearts be deceived, not only by the attractive things of this world, but be deceived by the pain and trauma that has been inflicted upon us that helps us to describe ourselves as human beings of this culture 
rather than your children and your beings. We know we got work to do. It's easier said than done. But turn us away, O oh God, from the woe direction and turn us toward you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And amen. Now, Charles Albert Tinley, once again, wants to say, it isn't going to be easy, but if we keep our eyes focused and on the prize, guess when we'll understand it? We'll understand it better. Bye. And bye. <laughs> are tossed and driven on the restless sea of time. The somber skies and howling tempest, hope succeed a bright sunshine. And in that land of perfect day, when the mists have rolled away, we will understand it better by and by. Singing by and by, oh, when the morning comes, the children and all the saints of my God are gathering home. We will tell the story of how we've overcome. demands a want of shelter and of food and thirsty hills and barren lands but we are trusting in the Lord and according to his word we will understand it better by and by and we're singing by and by oh when the morning comes children and all the saints of my God are gather at home and we will tell the story of how we've overcome oh, we'll understand it better by my trials dark on every hand and we cannot understand all the way that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But he guides us with his eye and we'll follow till we die. For we'll understand it better by and by. And we're singing by and by. Oh, when the morning comes, the children Gather at home, we'll be telling the story of how we've overcome before we'll understand it better by and by. There'll be temptations, hidden snares that often take us unawares, and our hearts are made to bleed for a thoughtless word or deed. When we try to do our best, but we'll understand it better by and by. Oh, we're singing by and by. Oh, when the morning comes, children and all the saints of God are gathering. Singing by and by.
hope you see what I mean when I tell you that Charles Albert Tinley changed gospel music and spirituals into this in-between space, y'all. <laughs> because before it had been, you know, uh, 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 sometimes I feel like a motherless child. So it had always been the woes. And Charles Albert Tinley wrote the song, We Shall Overcome, huh. although it was written as I'll Overcome Someday. But that was his song. We'll understand it better by and by. The storm is passing over. This in-between time of claiming the blessing. So that's why I bring to you Albert Tinley, the runaway slave, who I used to do a living history of. And he would learn how to read from the flour sacks and the barley sacks that he unloaded into the storeroom. Made his way to Philadelphia. Became a sexton in a Methodist church. And the minister saw that he liked to read, taught him how to read proper, availed him to all the books in his library. And he became a Methodist minister. He went to Goshen, New Jersey, and started a church where they burned their title of $40,000 after three years. Then he went to Wilmington, Delaware to start another larger church. And then they said, wherever you want to retire for all of your well-being and stewardship, we will give you that church. And you know, in Methodism, they send you, they don't give. <laughs> and he ended up going to the Methodist church, the 4th Street Methodist Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania which is now the famed Tindley Temple. <laughs> Counting your blessings, one by one. But now let us recognize that there are times that there are those of us who cannot, can't even see the forest for the trees. <laughs> We are lost in the forest and are crouching down beneath the tree. And all we feel is our weariness of God. God, all we feel is tired and hungry and thirsty and just want a clear direction out. So we come to you now, oh God, in that forest state, knowing that it is and can be where we are or where we might be tomorrow, because therefore, but by the grace of God, go we, O oh God, by your grace. So allow us, your people, O oh God, with our eyes closed or in, however we are in a posture of prayer, to have the vision of those who are lost in the woods, crouched underneath the tree, hoping for some miracle or another. Maybe it is those people who walked out of Port Authority when it closed at two in the morning because they cannot sleep there that much anymore. Maybe it was those people who got out and saw that the snow was coming down again. Maybe, just maybe, it is someone who is walking in one of the many parks of New York City, holding onto their stomach because they are so hungry and don't know where to go or what to do. Maybe, oh God, it is a mother in a home who is trying her best to console her children from the violence that occurred in the house the night before. Maybe, oh God, it is the prisoner 
who seeing no way out says maybe I should just take my life or take a life. I just don't want to hurt anymore. And oh God, maybe it's the person who is sitting there with the rubber tube tied around their arm begging for someone to stop them, oh God. In all these situations, oh God, we ask that you would bring your spirit and your love and your blessing upon them. May those who are stranded in the forest underneath the tree recognize that they are being shielded by the shade of the tree and that there will be fruit that will drop in due season and they will be able to eat and that as the gentle wind blows the leaves off the trees that it will create layers and layers of a blanket for them to be warm and this beautiful image oh God may we translate that to how we deal with the people in our midst May we fix the systems that make it so that you can't decide whether or not to go to our shelter or stay on the street. May we fix the brokenness in this world that we have so much food on this planet that more and more people will be going hungry because people are raising their prices, they say, for the supply and demand that is going on. And really... What they're not saying is that there's a group of people that want to keep lining their pockets. So we go hungry. So we pay more for gas. So we pay more for rent. And behind their desks and behind the doors of their gated communities, oh God, <laughs> they complain about profits going down. We complain about smaller portions of food. Fix this world, oh God. For that mother consoling her children, may she know that you will open the door at the right time, not the time that everybody else thinks that it's time for her to go, that it will be the right time so that when she goes and when she takes her children, she is stepping into your blessing, into your healing, and into your arms. help the perpetrator to know that even in his brokenness that if he can stop looking at his woes that you can find a way to bless him and heal them as well because it's not just him for that person with the rubber around their arm work a miracle <laughs> drop the spoon may it get too hot when it's being heated May the bottle drop on the street. And you recognize that you're down and out. And that when you are below the curb, <laughs> there's nowhere to look but up. <laughs> and there you are. There may we be your representatives of God. This is just a portion of what is going on in the world, Lord. This is just a portion of the woes that, 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 the, that the system seems to feed off of, that the system seems to want to keep in place so that people can keep their level of what they call happiness, that we know will be woes unto them in time being. But bring food, shelter, happiness, health, and yes, love. Your love, not deceptive love, into our lives. Be in us so that we can be yours in the world and to the world. Thank you, oh God, for the humility to name these things 
things out loud. With the humility to ask you to help us be a part of the blessing and not a part of the woes inflicted on the world. Holy Spirit, comfort us in the midst of this pain so that we can get up with that breath of life and go out into the world and do what Jesus calls us to do. Heal those who have unclean spirits so that they may turn their hearts back to God. As we move on to our offering, I have a very important piece of business to take care of. And I hope that our sister Kalua Palau Morrison is online today because I need you to tell me who's playing in the Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> the Cincinnati Bengals and the LA Rams. Did you hear that, Sister Kalua? The Cincinnati Bengals and the LA Rams are playing in the Super Bowl today. She said, I know who's doing the music, <laughs> and I can't figure out who's playing the game. So she said, Pastor, if you can't call me back, please make sure you mention it in the service. <laughs> so Kalua, you asked and you have received. And right now God is asking us. Asking us to give from our clean hearts <laughs> so that we may be a blessing in the community as we move forward with our ministry. You can go to our website, of course, at www.stjamesharlemnyc.org. Scroll down to the PayPal button, or if you go have your own PayPal account, it's St. James Harlem. It's St. James um, 409 at Verizon.net. That's how you'll find us there. You can mail in your offerings to 409 West Northern First Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. Um, we always tally up the envelopes and our finance committee goes upstairs and does all the tallying. And we bless you for your dear heart. We bless you for the dollar. We bless you for, if you want to give us $100,000 tomorrow, we'll take it. So don't mind us. Our treasurer, Thelma, will be happy to count that. <laughs> count it as a blessing. So in the meantime, we lift up these offerings that have been placed, even by some of the people who ended up leaving. They said, I gotta make sure I get my offering. <laughs> so we bless their heart. God, we know that we cannot be your giving to us. And we're not trying to. All we want to do is to give a little back to your will and your ministries in this world. Because you give so much to us, you want us to turn it into blessings and not into woes, God. So may these offerings be blessed. And may people understand that this is coming from their blessings. Not worrying about whether or not you're going to provide done it all these years there's no reason for you to stop now so let us trust in you and continue to give and continue to use these blessings for the
benefit all your people. In Jesus' name we pray. I believe our closing hymn is number... I know what it is, but I have been looking at it in the in two different hymn books, so you have to help, forgive me for this. And I know it's lift every voice and sing, and but what number is it? Number five hundred and sixty-three. And it's five forty in the in the other way around. In our African, in our Presbyterian no, hymnal, it's 563. In the African American Heritage Hymnal, it's 540. But you have the blue books, so it's 563. <laughs> we ask that if you are in the building, that you would stand for what we call the Negro National Anthem.
James Weldon Johnson and John Rosamond Johnson. We have come through, but you have led us through to where this bright star is cast. Because of all those bitter years, for all who have known our story, and for all who this story resonates in this country, be they black or white or Asian or Latinx or indigenous, we know that your light still shines, leading us to our blessings and not those woes. May we be able to share that wisdom of discernment with the world into which we go. Oh.